Hello and welcome. My name is Joe O'Mara. I'm the Head of Aviation Finance with KPMG. And on behalf of KPMG and Airline Economics, I'm delighted to be joined by Kieran Kaur. Kieran is the Global Head of Aviation Finance and the Country CEO for Standard Chartered in Ireland. Kieran is speaking to us for the purposes of our 2022 Aviation Leaders Report. And I should say we're recording this three days before Christmas. Kieran, thanks again for uh, giving us your insights for the report. Before we get into the meat of the questions, would you mind just telling our watchers a little bit of a standard chartered place in the aviation finance world? Sure, and, and good afternoon, Joe, and thanks for inviting me. So look, I head up the aviation finance business within Standard Chartered. Within the aviation finance business, we're active both in the operating lease market, where we're, we have commercial passenger aircraft on operating lease on a global basis to carriers all around the world. We're also actively involved in providing secure debt financing to carriers to finance their new deliveries, both in the wide body and narrow body space. We have a broader remit, but being part of the bank, we obviously provide debt capital market solutions and other financial market solutions, whether that's hedging through FX or rates or commodities, to not only to the airline community, but also we're active in doing transactions with the manufacturers and also providing financing to the airports on a global basis. Kieran, obviously that, that's a huge breadth of activity. Um, can I ask you maybe as we look broadly at the air travel space, um, we are now 21 months into what's been obviously the biggest dislocation we've seen, but, but where recovery is in progress. What have you seen from an airline customer performance over the course of 2021? Sure, look, look we, 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 we did see air travel was on the upward trend, particularly in the second half of 2021. Although the emergence now of the Omicron variant is likely to disrupt that recovery temporarily, certainly in the early parts of 2022. Uh, we are starting, we are expecting a strong bounce back in traffic by mid 2022. And that really is driven by recovery in the international markets, but growing vaccination rates, less stringent international travel restrictions in certain regions, and also in particular, strong leisure demand during the busy summer seasons in Europe. I suppose the threat is, is Joe, is that the, you know, the threat of new variants coupled with the regional variation, the success of the vaccination rollouts makes it very difficult to predict with any sort of certainty, the pace or timing of the recovery. And, and taking that uncertainty that's there, you guys have still been very, very active, uh, you know, really from the outset of COVID. In, in thinking about it from an opportunities perspective, where have you seen the opportunities given that uncertainty that's been in the market? Well, look, in the early parts of COVID, we saw lots of opportunities to help the airlines shore up their liquidity. So some of the larger carriers were looking to raise liquidity quickly by leveraging their um, effectively un un unencumbered assets in their fleet. So we were very active in 2020 in providing sailing lease back solutions of scale to the better quality airlines all around the world. In addition to that, we were very active at that time in 2020 providing debt solutions to carriers as they were looking to raise term loans against as, as a way effectively of shoring up liquidity because at that time in 2020, there was a lot of uncertainty as regards the timing of the recovery. I think moving into 21, we saw more normality right, uh, coming back into the market and there was probably more, we were probably more active like other participants in your regular sale and leaseback opportunities. Um, the issue is that when you look at the new tech, most of the investors are targeting to buy new technology aircraft types, the single aisle aircraft in the operating lease market. Um, and the problem that we have there is that there's lower production rates. Many of the better quality airlines still have access to the banking and capital debt markets. So they're, they're, they want to keep the aircraft on their balance sheet. You've increased investor demand. So you've increased number of investors chasing fewer sale and leaseback opportunities with the better quality names, which is impacting one, the success in winning mandates, but two, driving down some of the pricing in the, in the sale and leaseback market. And how have you found the challenges in assessing value in those new transactions post COVID? Is it still back to the fundamentals that you would have looked at before around liquidity or airline performance history? Um, 
or are there new metrics you're bringing in a result of COVID, and particularly perhaps around the geographic basis and you say those restrictions that might be there? Yeah, for, for us, when we looked, what we, we, you know, we, we look to diversify the fleet by jurisdiction, by credit and by asset type. But when we look at the counterparty risk, we focus a lot on what the promoter support, how much promoter support they've got through this downturn and um, how core are the fleet that were financing to their, to their fleets. And because you would think if they were to go through a restructuring or run into problems, the core fleet will be retained by the airline. We also look at liquidity buffers. We look at the leverage, all the usual metrics um, that carry. But more importantly, we also look at their competitive position in the market and their, their business models, their ability to tilt between passenger and freight operations. Some of the carriers have been able to weather the storm by switching some of their operations more away from passenger into the freight market. And that's been very successful um, for some of those carriers. So, so there are some of the criteria that we would look at. And looking maybe more broadly at the leasing space, you know, we talk about this airline distress, we've seen the challenges that's put on them from a balance sheet perspective, and, and, and it has made leasing more attractive. Um, we've talked about that kind of 50% barrier being there for a long period of time, probably a general acceptance that that's been breached. And, and I'd say some lessor has been quite bullish about you know 60% of new deliveries are going to move to leasing. Your thoughts on where that percentage might go, and is the pandemic going to give rise to a sustainable step change in the importance of lessors in the aviation finance ecosphere? I don't think there's going to be any, I personally don't think there'll be any shift in the long-term trend. I think, look, at the end of the day, you've got to go back to the fundamentals. Why do airlines use operating lease? They use it as a capacity and residual risk management tools. They use it to get access to 100% funding, 100% financing. They also use it as a way to get access to aircraft quicker. So because there's shorter lead times getting aircraft from an operating lessor than there are than there are the ordinary aircraft from the manufacturer directly. So while I think in the near term you may see a, a, a larger percentage of operating lease, I think the longer term trend will remain the same. What percentage that comes out at, it's hard to predict. And I think it'll be very different between the narrow body and wide body market, because I think you will see going forward a much lower participation in lessors in the wide body area space. And, and you talked a little bit around this, the, the competitive piece around yields, you know, narrow body, new tech, people clearly have a, a big focus on for very good reasons. Um, your thoughts on where pricing has gone, um, and, and I know there's more than lease rate factor, right? That there's other elements that, that bring through. General anecdotal, you know, post COVID, there was a bit of a risk premium or element that people were, were getting into relation to sale and lease back, but seems to have regressed now to definitely pre COVID levels. Is that consistent with what you're seeing? Uh, no, I would agree. I think, look, lease rate factors um, have softened. That does reflect the lower interest rate environment. But I think when you look at the single aisle aircraft, the, the market that we focus on, if you look at new technology aircraft, there's lower production rates. So there's lower numbers of deliveries and um, the stronger and there's been a flight to quality. So most the investors are targeting the better quality names. Those carriers have continue to have access to the banking and capital markets. So they want to keep aircraft on balance sheet. So there's a larger number of investors chasing fewer deals, particularly in the new technology narrow bodies. I think when you look at the current technology aircraft, it's slightly different. It's still, it, there's, it's still you know, impacted by the lower interest rate environment, but, but also the oversupply of current generation aircraft at the moment has solved from the lease rates. Now, there's one exception to that. The 737-800s were still seeing stronger demand and firmer lease rates, but I think that benefits from the lower, the slower introduction um, or deliveries of the MAX aircraft, but also investors targeting the 737-800 for feedstock for their passenger to conversion programs. You mentioned the interest rate environment we've been in for a long period of time now, probably a general acceptance that, that we're moving to a higher interest rate environment. You know, on a staggered basis, the Fed talking about two or three rate rises mm -hmm. next year. When you look out at that horizon, how do you feel about that from the perspective of your business? Net positive, net negative, possibly neutral? What are your thoughts? Look, there's, there's a strong correlation between interest rates and lease rates. And that going back through history, through the business cycles, that, that has been consistent. At the moment, the there's a you know, the all-in cost of debt has fallen which has been reflected in people willing to take lower lease rates. 
and still get an adequate return that they've been looking for. I think as rates rise, we will see hardening of lease rate factors. And um, I suppose the only thing to think about is we have new entrants coming into the sector. They may have different yield criteria than the established players. So they may be targeting a lower risk adjusted return than what traditional SRs would have targeted in the past. So, you know, there is some uncertainty, but the expectation would be, in my view, having been through a number of cycles, that you will see lease rates firming as interest rates rise. You mentioned kind of some of the new entrants that come in there. As, as we look at the broader lease space, what has clearly happened last decade and beyond has been a breakout of concentration. So just more lessors, taking more of the pie, but, but, but splitting it out more broadly. We obviously have the air camp, GCAS transaction driving a bit of consolidation. We've had a bunch of new players, as you mentioned, join again, it's private equity backed and, and other elements to it. How do you see that looking from a concentration perspective? Do you think that tightens over the coming time or do we just continue to see new platforms, new players, some consolidation, but the market stays pretty diversified? Look, I think there's a mixture. I think you will see, continue to see some consolidation as we've seen. However, when we use the term consolidation, we normally think of it as having fewer parties having a more dominant position in the industry. I don't think that's going to happen. I think you'll, you won't see a slowing of the pace of new entrants coming into the sector. Because when you look at it, Joe, um, from an investor's point of view, aircraft residuals and yields in, in the aviation space have proven to be pretty robust versus other asset classes. And as some of these new entrants look to diversify their portfolio investment strategies, they're looking to aviation as an alternative asset class. So I think that will continue. I also, you know, I also see, you know, we've seen some recent MA activity, which is the sign of a healthy functioning market. So that's positive. I think that you will see as rising from some of that recent MA activity, you may see some of those lessors selling off some of their portfolios or a portion of their portfolios to deal with asset and client concentration risks that will arise as part of any uh, merger. Yeah, and I think that's very true. We're going to see that, particularly on Aircap GCAS, when they have that debt to equity plan they, they plan to get to. Logical thing is a lot of portfolios hitting the market. And it probably feeds into my next question for you, which, which is really around the trading environment. You know, not a lot had happened in 20. You guys would generally be very active, acquisitive, but, but you trade a lot. How have you found the trading environment has moved over the course of 21? And where do you think that's going to go next year? Look, we've been very successful, thankfully, in the in trading aircraft in the secondary market with leases attached and also without leases attached. The, the sale of aircraft off lease has been, by and large, the older or uh, midlife assets, you know, particularly for selling aircraft to investors that are looking to do passenger to freighter conversion. I think the there's lots of liquidity, and um, particularly if you have the right asset type in the single aisle market with you know with a, a lease attached to a stronger performing lessee. Um, we are seeing a lot of appetite in the secondary market from a whole multitude of players across all across the various regions. I think that'll continue. I think there will be a tilt towards new technology aircraft over time. So I think particularly with the whole ESG agenda, I think some of the new investor appetite will be targeting more new technology aircraft than current generation aircraft. Um, but that, that time will tell on that front. So I still see a deep secondary market, particularly on the more, um, you know, in the single aisle aircraft. I think for niche aircraft, I think it'll be more challenging to trade. And I think it, particularly in the wide body market, there has been pretty limited secondary trading on the wide body front. And on the debt side of the house, you would have seen you know, some of the traditional banks retrench a little bit uh, at the outset of the crisis. How, where do you think that market sits now? Is it back functioning and being where it needs to be? Um, and just as a corollary to that, I'm interested in your thoughts on the kind of non-traditional lenders, the alternative lenders that have entered the space over the last 18 months or so. Yeah, I, look, on the on the lending side, it's interesting. I think we've seen a certain retrenchment of certain financial institutions back to home and regional markets. Despite um, how they may communicate externally, I think we are seeing a certain amount of retrenchment to home markets. Um, and, and that's more a finite capacity that some of these financial institutions may have for the particular sector or uh, for this sector. Um, I think that you, we will see an adjustment to loan to value ratios for certain asset types, maybe tenors. Um, I don't see 
I think that you may see more tempered interest or less interest in providing limited recourse debt. Um, but I think on your traditional secured lending to stronger counterparties, I think there's still abundance of liquidity. And as you say, there's also a number of new entrants coming into that space where they see it being well secured, good returns, and giving you longer tenor business. Um, so it's attractive to a number of the investors. You, you mentioned the ESG point a second ago. Obviously, look, the existential crisis we're facing on a global basis and will be mm. hugely important for aviation and by extension, aviation finance. Can I ask, as we sit here today, is it having an impact either on the debt or the investor side in aviation finance? Well, look, we're actually, we're not seeing um, a direct impact on less or our airline's ability to raise financing as a result of ESG issues. Um, we are starting to see a, an increased number of ESG metrics or objectives being uh, forming part of financing. You know, whether that's through green bonds at a corporate level or whether it's, you know, a sustainability metrics being incorporated into loans, you know, with incentives or penalties depending on performance. Um, we certainly expect there to be a, this to be there to be an increase, though, particularly as investors place more and more focus on companies ESG performance. Um, there are a growing number of institutional investors that you know apply ESG criteria in investment analysis, and that they'll be making these a key criteria in deciding where they invest their funds. Um, as they continue to, uh, as as this continues, we're likely to see, in my view, pricing implications. Perceived underperformance from the ESG performance may lead to reduced liquidity in paper. But also, I think, look, from the financiers, you know, financiers have their own com commitments to the ESG agenda. So it they also require increased confidence that the companies that they're supporting or backing will decarbonize, this, uh, or else they're putting their own objectives at jeopardy. So if you look at us at Standard Chartered, um, you know, we've committed to net zero from our financing activities by 2050. So our interest in the success of aviation finance business is very much aligned with the, you know, the that of the aviation sector. And just, just playing that out as to how, where it might end up with your thoughts around it. This is more curiosity and speculation on my part, but do we end up in a situation where potentially if you're funding you know, new tech aircraft, there is a real and meaningful bounce to you either on the equity side, as you say, it's widening the pool of investors who might be interested or on a similar on the debt side, right? Where you might get dinged in situations where you're not in new tech and you're into you know, a more polluting type of aircraft. Well, look, look, I think it's hard to know at the moment, but I, I broadly agree with what you're saying. I think, look, I think the key is, um, I look, I think the key for all of us is to help the airlines to, you know, transition their fleets to newer technology aircraft. Um, you know, because to, to, make, to, to make sure that they can, you know, operate the most efficient aircraft. Um, but also to help with improvements in operational efficiency in aircraft, both on the air and in the ground. Um, I do think there'll also be an increased use of carbon offsetting or capture, but based on our experience, the overriding objective of the clients that we bank is to try and reduce their overall carbon footprint. So the big, the big focus is on reducing carbon intensity rather than on offsets, that's our view. But as regards pricing, I'm not sure. I think that, look, I think if you look at us as an industry, I think we've made significant improvements with respect to carbon intensity. But the targets that we've set have been exceptionally you know, challenging. I think in my view, when I look at ESG, it's what's critical to the achievement of the targets that we've set for the industry is the wider, widespread use of you know, sustainable aviation fuels. And look, for that, it's the ability to scale up supply and infrastructure and also to get regulatory support for maximum use of the sustainable aviation fuels is going to be key. So there's a lot of factors at play here within, you know, on the ESG agenda. Yeah, and I, I totally get that, right? And you look at the IATA figures and the focus on SAF, and it's the primary building block over the next decade. Mm. But one final one on ESG, just to ask you, uh, in aviation finance, are you predominantly a taker? You're not making the aircraft, you're not operating the aircraft. How do you play your part in, in trying to make sure we move towards those very ambitious targets? Okay, look, well, I suppose, look, 
as a lessor or financer, it's very important that we understand what their, our, the, you know, the airlines, our clients' objectives are. Um, look, we're committed to supporting the clients to help them to transition to newer technology, more fuel efficient aircraft. But as a bank, being part of, you know, we look at when we look across the wider bank, we're a leading player in the green and sustainability linked financing space. And we continue to incentivize clients to achieve their climate goals through this medium. But what are we doing differently? I suppose what we're trying to do with, in, on the banking side is we're trying to explore how across our diverse client base, we might be able to better support infrastructure or R&D into, into projects for sustainable aviation fuels, you know, to enable our airlines to maximize their use of them. Um, but we've also been working on a number of platforms to support the carbon credit market. So we have a number of different um, angles there that's where we're trying to contribute to the whole climate agenda. And you, you talked to you know we talked a good bit around the metal um, and and as you said that that narrow body focus is very logical in, in today's environment. You mentioned the start. You, you guys also, from a debt perspective, are, are funding wide bodies. You know you're, you're dealing with your, your airline customers uh, on a stand back basis. What do you view as you know investable metal to you? Like obviously narrow body new tech makes sense. Everything makes sense at the right price. But but when you think about investable metal, where is your head at on that, Kieran? Look, I think when you look at the wide body market, look, the much slower recovery in the medium to long haul international market has really impacted or negatively impacted the wide body market. Um, and even with the slow recovery, we're seeing increased demand for the, you know, the newer technology wide bodies. So uh, the 787s and 8350s, you know, that may have that more flexible models and more utility. Um, we expect the demand for current technology wide bodies to be black, to be, to, we see a very slow recovery in that market. Um, in the narrow body market, I suppose when we look at, when we, you know, and that is our focus in the single aisle aircraft. Um, look, it's very dependent on what's going to happen on with respect to production rates, because what we are seeing is we are seeing a slowing of the retirement of some of the single aisle aircraft. Now, that's, the reason for that is that a number of the investors in midlife or older assets don't want to part out aircraft at the, at the moment. So they're deferring those plans to retire the aircraft on the expectation that there'll be an increased demand for spare parts once the recovery happens in the overall tra in travel market. So there's different dynamics at play between the single line and wide body markets at the moment. But for us, our focus is on the leasing side is purely single aisle aircraft. On the debt side, we're indifferent, whether it's wide body or single aisle, but we obviously are more focused on the wide body side on the counterparty risk and the effectively the LTV in the terms of the secured debt. Um, I do think there will be a change in the market. I think going forward, I think that you will see fewer traditional lessors playing in the wide body market. And I think there'll be an increased demand our prevalence of credit enhanced or export financing on the wide body deliveries going forward. And to briefly touch on the investor side, um, you know, obviously you've had a very committed and long-term shareholder behind you that's backed you guys in a very real way. Your thoughts on the broader market, do you, do you think that we're gonna see different, let me ask this in a different way, is it the same types of investors that are going to continue to fund what will remain significant capital requirements uh, on the aviation finance side for the foreseeable in that, you know, it might be different private equity players, but it's still private equity. It might be different pockets of Japanese capital, but it's still Japanese capital. We've seen Chinese probably retrench a little bit, even pre-COVID. Your thoughts on that broader investor base coming at aviation finance? What do you think there's been any shifts in that uh, since we've seen the outset of COVID? Look, the, the, the motivations of the different promoters of the leasing companies to enter or exit um, is different in the different geographies. You know, we have seen a greater prevalence of private equity participating at the downturn in the cycles, where they're looking to play the cycle. Um, I think it's a little bit different this time because I think scale is becoming more and more important and some of the new entrants to the private equity space are looking to scale up and build significant businesses. Um, I think that you know there are some emerging risks that we have to keep in mind. Whether that's you know we talked about the ESG agenda and um, but also I think Basel IV etc. So we need to keep that under review. 
And depending on how those regulatory changes occur, you could see a different profile, in my view, of the promoters of the different leasing companies um, across the world. Kieran, just in closing, uh, as we come through what have been an incredibly challenging 21 months for everyone across aviation, you know, parking Omicron, right, uh, for the moment, there's, there's a sense that the recovery is, is there and there's a clear, clear evidence wherever we've seen it, restrictions drop, air travel recoveries. What are your optimism levels like? as you look out into 2022? Well, I'm very optimistic. One, because we have a very, you know, well-capitalized promoter behind us. Uh, we have an appetite to grow the business. I think, the, you know, our portfolio is probably very different than many of our peers in that we have 98% of our fleet is single-aisle aircraft that have shown more resilience and more liquidity right through the downturn. So I think we've been able to demonstrate um, to our stakeholders the ability to re re restructure leases where there were issues or redeploy aircraft that got displaced at airlines through this downturn. Um, so for us, the, the liquidity and the single aisle aircraft the global reach of our platform to be able to transition aircraft on a global basis, um, I think is a testament to the capabilities we have in-house. I suppose we also think that going forward, airlines will be more selective and the OEMs on the counterparties that they deal with, because I think airlines want to see a broader offering than just leasing. So for us, we try to differentiate ourselves by offering the airlines a combination of commercial debt, export financing, credit hand solution, working capital, um, you know, leasing solutions. It gives us a much better detailed knowledge of the airline's business models, but it also helps us to adapt to their needs right through the cycle. And I think that partnership, that support we have provided to the airline clients we have in the room will, will stand us in good stead in the recovery. Kieran, on that optimistic note, I'd like to thank you for your time and insights today and wish both you and Sandra Chartered a very successful 2022. Thanks again. Thanks, Joe. Many happy returns to yourself and, KP and your colleagues in KPNG and to the airline economics team. Thank you.